my parliamentarian to get up here. She is so slow. There. <laughs> But did you get your coffee? That's what we want to know. She got, she got his coffee. Thanks to Joe Hyman, he brought us all coffee. So therefore, he gets the reward, the convention reward. And I say that only because he's not in here at this moment. So we can do that. such a joy to be able to get around to the Missouri Senate all over the place. So I've calculated this is probably over a hundred district conventions that I've attended now. So uh, it's really quite an interesting perspective to have over time and a, and a joy. A joy to meet so many old friends, meet new friends. It's always rather poignant when you they go through the list of pastors and church workers who have passed away, often in the convention memorials, and you see friends and uh, guys you knew for years and years. So uh, the Lord is uh, the Lord is in His heavens, and He's looking over us and being merciful to us. So we all know there's tons of challenges going on. The rural churches are deeply challenged. We have uh, challenges getting into the cities. We have, uh, you know. We have, we're facing the, one of the strongest moves away from the church in the history of Christianity, certainly in the West, uh, in the last 12 years with a growing number of nuns and uh, the 
German friend said, uh, they've gotten to the point in Germany where the people don't no longer know what they don't know. They've been away from the church so long. And we're heading, of course, right into that direction. And yet the Lord has us here for one purpose. The world continues to exist for the sake of the gospel till the full number of the elect come in. And it is our great privilege that the Lord mysteriously uses people like us, weak though we are, ragged though we are, he wills to use you to bring in the full number of those who shall be saved. And that is a glorious mystery. So I want to, you know, in light of the challenges, I, I just want to lay out before you kind of the tip of the iceberg on a number of the good stuff, the good things going on in the Missouri Senate, uh, which is good for us to hear from time to time. COVID was a challenge, wasn't it? You know, I for one uh, believe in retrospect that the government should have nothing to do. We shouldn't let them anywhere near the sanctuaries of our church. Right. Problem is when I say that in some districts, I get dead silence. <laughs> so the views of the Senate are not all similar. And there are different views depending on where you're at regionally. Not everybody had exactly the same approach. And like it or not, it is not a sin to watch CNN, much as we like, you know, I might like to say it is. <laughs> but it kind of depends on uh, what the news you watch, what view you had on, on the pandemic. And uh, one pastor said, I found out, I thought I had a purple congregation. I found out I had two congregations, one blue and one red. Uh, so many challenges, but we made it through. Our, our approach basically nationally was to say, you know, you at the local level are gonna make decisions based on local circumstances, local laws, local convictions. And uh, that's what we tried to do and did do. We supported many different efforts around the country individual congregations brought uh, Alliance Defending Freedom to the table and several other uh, uh, religious rights group organizations. We assisted uh, when some of our districts joined forces ecumenically with others like in Minnesota. We did this all while navigating the legal issues with LCMS Legal. Uh, it's very complex because in order to keep us all out of legal jeopardy, uh, legal gives advice that uh, for all of us and for all the districts so we don't go down a legal rabbit hole in one place and get uh, nailed for it in another place in the country because we're inconsistent in the way we defend our synodical rights and system, etc. But uh, the Lord blessed us through it all and uh, remarkably so. You know, it, it have, I don't think it happened since I've been around, but uh, you know, districts give a percentage generally of the receipts they receive from congregations. We had a, an increase of a million dollars from districts to Synod this last year because of COVID, because of the generosity of our people. That's really rather astounding. Uh, we, we were able to help about a, a thousand church workers, pastors and commissioned workers with grants of grants of uh, averaging about $1,500. And, uh, that was a great thing to be able to do. You know, so many of our teachers and commissioned workers work on a shoestring. They dedicate their lives to uh, teaching, sharing the gospel, caring for people. And uh, you know, pastors, nine-tenths of it, in fact, 99% of the, the task of being a pastor is showing up. Robert Price used to tell us if people see you in their living rooms and their pulpit, you'll never have any problems. That's true. And to show up and tell a, a pastor or a teacher in need that your church loves you, we love you, and here's, it's not a ton of money, but it's significant for your life right now. And to receive all those thanks from those people who are so thankful for the church. It was the donors, uh, the mercy donors of the Synod, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and districts that provided that about $1.5 million to various workers who were in need. So we we're very thankful about that. Doxology uh, retreats, those continue apace. We funded about 30 of them so far. Now we're moving into uh, retreats for commissioned ministers. 
uh, I don't know how familiar you are with doxology, but it's about spiritual well-being. It's about uh, mental well-being, about uh, classical kind of pastoral care, even the word. And uh, they have been uh, remarkably helpful for many people. We've got the 703 Task Force working on Lutheran identity and mission in the Concordia University system. It's a constant challenge, you know, and it's like, uh, and they, they proposed a new way for the Synod to relate to its schools. That is, uh, allow the schools basically to say, you know, the property is yours. The, uh, uh, the decisions about the property, the buildings, is yours. No more appro approvals for uh, your building plans uh, from the Missouri Center Board of Directors. However, there, there would be an accreditation model where there would be an ecclesiastical accreditation, a visitation to say, this school gets the good Missouri Center good housekeeping seal uh, to teach and be a, a school uh, certified to teach church workers for the Missouri Center. Of course, that's receiving pushback, you know. Uh, you can't please everybody all the time. And uh, uh, so I don't, I don't know. The, the one provision says a Board of Regents may take a school out of the system. What I worry about is a rogue Board of Regents deciding to remove a school from the Synod. So uh, it may need some modification. But it's a conversation that is ongoing and will come up and I'm sure you, you'll have questions about that. Uh, we've had some really great additions this last triennium for leadership at our schools. Dr. Bull at Concordia, Nebraska. Uh, Dr. Dawn at Concordia, Chicago. Concordia, Chicago had, had a, a number of programs like women's studies programs, etc., that were <coughs> philosophically at odds with the fundamental mission of the Missouri Synod. Uh, they've uh, reduced those programs in Chicago, and it's a tough go in Cook County, but uh, they're doing an excellent job there. Dr. Friedrich at Concordia St. Paul, a great uh, addition there. Concordia St. Paul right now is offering a top $6,000 a year tuition maximum for church work students, teachers. And not only that, they're offering no tuition for pre sem students. So kudos to uh, Friedrich and Concordia St. Paul. Michael Thomas is at Concordia University, Irvine, and doing a great job. I would say these, these four are uh, a great strength, great uh, advance in theological accountability and uh, ability in, in uh, being heads of our schools. We're very thankful about that. You may have seen the kerfuffle going on at Concordia, uh, Concordia, Wisconsin. How many of you are aware of the matter with uh, Schultz and have seen that thing going around? Quite a few of you. It's a challenging issue. We put together a visitation team to go to Concordia, Texas, but also uh, Concordia, Wisconsin, and Ann Arbor. Uh, we talked to, I think, 113 or 118 faculty, staff, students in Concordia, Wisconsin, and Ann Arbor. Um, uh, they, we are making some suggestions there. I will deliver a report. That report is going to be confidential, uh, strictly confidential. It will go to uh, the leadership of the school soon, and they will have a chance to review, report back to me, and then uh, we'll give the regents time to make some uh, corrections and additions. You know, it's really challenging. Uh, there was just a hiring, a note on hiring, for instance, for Ann Arbor, it's a public note, which says a new professor must be, uh, so must be, uh, where is it, supported, but is committed to something like that, uh, anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. All great words, right? Good to be anti-racist, good to be for diversity, equity, inclusion. But um, I just brought this up here, I've been reading Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. This is the Bible for anti-racism. And anti-racism is, is a code word for, uh, instead of saying, you know, it is not sufficient, he says, to say, I'm not racist. What you must be is actively 
anti-racist, and that is what you must be is actively attacking racist policies. And it just so happens that racist policies are very broad. Uh, everybody from Lyndon Johnson, despite the Great Society, had racist policies. Nixon, of course, had racist policies. Uh, George Bush had racist policies. Trump, of course, is a racist. Uh, any, any legislation which would call for a tougher stance on crime is racist. Uh, any uh, policy that does not advance the rights of transsexual people over against religious freedom rights, like us saying we need to have the First Amendment freedom to have the kind of professors we want in our schools, etc. That's racist. Uh, I, I mean, uh, he attended one of our most recent schools in Queens, New York. New York. Uh, that, that place was racist, uh, despite the fact of being majority black, etc. We have the greatest anti-racist teaching in the universe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall perish. We have the greatest anti-racist teaching in the universe. Every person is created in the image of Almighty God, and as such, equally valuable, precious in his sight. We have the greatest anti-racist teaching in the universe. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all his sins. Every single person is worth the blood of Jesus. And to say, to hire a professor and say, must, uh, must submit to the, the public doctrine of the Missouri Senate, but be committed to the anti-racist agenda, which is code word. That's like saying, you must be supportive of the constitutional bylaws of the Missouri Senate, including the inerrancy of scripture, uh, but also be committed to the historical critical method. And, and what bothers me about this stuff is where it gets hold in schools, it travels. And what bothers me is, uh, it's not that it sh these kind of books shouldn't be in our universities, they should, they should be studied. But we can't just invite the philosophy in without rigorous critique. So uh, it's a real issue, and uh, it's, uh, these are challenges that are part of our times. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to thoughtfully, carefully uh, consider them. And uh, you know, basically what, what bothers me too is that all of a sudden you're saying anybody who has any conservative policy beliefs is inherently racist. That's going quite a step farther than saying uh, there are political ideas, there are different views on crime and punishment. Those are all acceptable within the, within the Lutheran Church. There are different viewpoints on what we should do. But all of a sudden you've said racist, not acceptable. Other than that, there's no big deal. <laughs> Tom Ager is at uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis, doing a great job, off to a great start. The seminaries are in good financial shape. Encourage your people to go to SEMS. SMP program is great. It has given us options and uh, much needed options. That is wonderful. It's also this, the, the situation that we are increasingly getting pockets in the Synod where we don't have uh, deep theological training. You know as well as I do in, in circuits, we need, we need those eggheads here and there. We need the guy who did well in Hebrew. We need the guy who did well in Greek. We need the guy who, who can handle the confessions very well. And so there's a good balance. We need the guys who are good at outreach and mission, et cetera. So there's a good balance. Uh, we need the SMP program. We need residential students. We especially need residential uh, non-Anglo or ethnic students at our seminaries so that they could get the, uh, the full uh, seminary education and also provide deep theological leadership for their communities in the future. It's really important. And uh, we are blessed in our seminaries. They're in good shape financially. Church relations is rocking and rolling. Uh, you see the picture up there. Uh, the president of the Malagasy Lutheran Church is holding my banjo. 
Uh, I, I play at Schlafly's Brewery by the seminary every Sunday. I'm in town from three to six with a bluegrass band. And uh, I was surprised that Malagasy's had come to visit us and they wanted to say goodbye before leaving the next day. They came to the Schlafly's and they wanted a picture with them holding all the bluegrass instruments. So they, <laughs> and one guy said, they told us that uh, you were bad, but you're not bad. You play the bad joke. <laughs> he doesn't know me well yet. <laughs> no, actually, we know him very well. He's uh, President Dennis, a graduate of our Fort Wayne Seminary. And you know, you can easily underestimate these guys. And then you realize he's the president of the church body of 4.5 billion members. And uh, these are serious people. We had a nice long conversation over almost two weeks with the CDCR and others. We've been putting this together for a long time toward church fellowship. We're not there yet, but we're having very serious conversations. It was a tremendous visit. They went to both seminaries. They uh, uh, did a number of things, and we had a great time. It was fun. It was uh, probably seven, uh, probably 65 degrees at the car at Bush Stadium for a baseball game. They're bundled up, they got hats on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, I'll mention that in a minute. Religious freedom in Finland. The Finland situation has been quite interesting. Our newest partner church, Church Johanna Poyola, studied in one of our seminaries about 20 years ago. And lo and behold, they, they wrote a track, uh, Paivi Raisinen, a female member of the Finnish parliament, an Orthodox Lutheran, wrote a track about Christian marriage. She quoted Romans 1 and some other passages. And all of a sudden, eight year, they published it through Lutheran Heritage Foundation in Finnish. All of a sudden, eight, or, eight years later, the Finnish state prosecutor uh, uh, prosecutes them for hate crimes. Hate crimes. And uh, so this got worldwide attention. Alliance Defending Freedom, Freedom International defended them. And uh, they just won the case, but the state prosecutor has promised to appeal. Uh, very interesting. I would call you on him during the process and say, how you doing? And he'd say, look, we're great. Every time they attack, we just grow. You might be beholding your future. And uh, you know, what, what they did uh, about a little over 10 years ago when they started the church, they, they had uh, probably one of the largest, if not the largest, worshiping Lutheran community in the entire Finnish state church, which has gone crazy. And uh, they would not accept women pastors or the sexuality issues. And so the state church kicked them out of the building. Imagine you've been in your building for years, a place where all the great spiritual events of your life and your family have happened. And they say, you're gone, get out. And so they left, and then it turned out being a real blessing because they discovered that Seventh day at Venice don't worship on Sunday. <laughs> and then they discovered the Seventh day at Venice gave, would give them a very good deal on using the space. They call them the useful heresy. <laughs> of course, the Seventh day at Venice are making a little money, so they call the Lutherans the useful heresy. But anyway, they started. Uh, renting Seventh-day Adventist buildings and making sure they had a pastor at each place. Split off 20, 30 people up to 100, up of 100. Start a church. Split again. Start a church. Split it again. Get a pastor. Start a church. They have over 40 congregations now. 40. <laughs> the, uh, we'll have a couple of churches coming in on the uh, fast, so-called uh, fast route for church related, church fellowship, Evangelical Lutheran Church of Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, this, these, I think the one of them was uh, started by Lutheran Heritage Foundation years ago. It's all Missouri Senate. It should have been a fellowship of us years ago, I think. That'll be uh, up for a vote of ratification in 2023 in Milwaukee. Ukraine has been interesting. And I was there in Odessa a few years ago. I, who would have thought that uh, we would be, they would be asking us for black jackets and helmets for their pastors to go out distributing the sacrament? A 
among their terrified Lutheran people. Uh, Ukraine is not exactly, you know, Zelensky is a hero, but he's not exactly Thomas Jefferson. And uh, the, the, the state really attacked our church badly and, and really um, allowed some terrible things to happen there. We've continued to support them and, and the bishop. There are several different Lutheran bodies in Ukraine. Uh, we didn't even ask for money, and I think you've sent in almost $3 million in aid for Ukrainians. So we are helping all of our partners and friends in and around Ukraine with dollars to care for refugees. And uh, what's a, a very interesting side note, there are last count 1,100 Ukrainian refugees in Wittenberg, Germany. And we've just now opened up our Wittenberg school, old Latin school, to house Ukrainian Lutheran refugees, and we call a Ukrainian Lutheran pastor. And so, uh, strangely enough, we have a Ukrainian Lutheran church star in Wittenberg, Germany. <laughs> Truth is stranger than fiction. LWML, God bless the LWML. I mean, uh, more than $2 million uh, in their cycle to uh, give to the mission, the local district missions. Uh, Missions of the Missouri Center internationally is fantastic. But I would say this especially, the, the, the task of lifting up women in this day and age is so very important. I mean, uh, we, can't, we can hardly even talk to our uh, women anymore in the church in a reasonable language. I've started, I'm trying to get a hold of this, you know, there's a, there's a delusion going on. I, I read the UK, the number of transgender uh, incidents has, go, has gone up 4,000% in the last few years. This is not science. We've known what percentage of the population has gender dysphoria. 4,000% uh, increase is not a scientific uh, kind of, it, it is, is mass delusion driven in part by internet, by praise of people coming out, et cetera. If, have you uh, seen Matt Walsh's movie on what is a woman? Yeah. Watch it. It's all about the movement to uh, surgically and medically alter sex in adolescence, uh, prepubescent, and others. I mean, some of you, I know, I've talked to pastors in Missouri Center, and one guy said, uh, a wonderful student in my uh, confirmation class a few years ago just came out and she had had a breast removed, you know. And the crazies promoting this are just, watch the, watch the movie, it's shocking. So how do you, you know, how do we begin to get a hold of this? I just, you know, our young women, I, I, women have superpowers, you know? <laughs> You, you can create a child within your womb. Women have superpowers. Uh, you can take an average, halfway decent young man and turn him into a darn good Christian husband or father. You know, it's like, uh, I, I was in Sioux City recently and with my wife and I, I was filling up the gas and she's talking to the gas station attendant. She's talking with him and talking with him. She finally gets back to the car and said, who was that? And she said, that's my old boyfriend. <laughs> I said, I bet I know what you're thinking. And she said, yeah, if I'd married him, he'd be president of Missouri City. <laughs> I like that line from my big fat Greek wedding where the mother says, True, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck, and she turns the head in any direction she wants. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, the, the reality of this feminine superpower, you know, to, uh, to make life marvelous and full, and uh, how, how do we even have words to praise this fantastic, divine created gift. This whole move of gender dysphoria, sex alteration, as, as though you could alter the sex of every <clears throat> single cell in your body. It's ridiculous. 
how do we uphold <coughs> women? Yes, you know, the uh, feminist movement and uh, uh, the sexual revolution brought all kinds of untold opportunities for women. Who wouldn't want, I got my little granddaughter, who wouldn't want a fine education for their granddaughter? Who wouldn't want opportunities to serve in various ways? But it also brought a, a terrible downside in erase, trying to erase uh, sex. I don't talk about gender anymore because uh, people use that to talk about as though there are infinite numbers of gender. How do we be compassionate to people who struggle with gender dysphoria, but at the same time uphold the fantastic, especially marvelous vocations of women, sister, mother, grandmother, neighbor. Those are fantastic. Challenging, it's challenging stuff for us, but we've got it. We've got it. the gospel and the blessed doctrine of creation, which I think is suffering the greatest heresies of our, uh, of our era. The Office of International Mission, the Missouri Senate is not, the Purple Palace is not a big bloated bureaucracy. You know, we've had about 12 people our missionary numbers are down because of COVID. We, our recruiting was down, and the uh, transition off the field for health reasons, some other things, was up. So we've, we've got work to do to get back up to the 140 mark or so. That's our plan. We even plan to get up to the 180 mark in, up to, uh, in, in five years. God help us, amen. Many of our missionaries are theological educators. That's what our partners are asking for all over the world. And uh, that's what we give to them. That multiplies pastors, deaconesses, and others. So they're out proclaiming the gospel, planting churches uh, uh, on fire. We have, we have essentially 12 staff taking care of recruitment, training, placement, care on the field. And care on the field includes care for children who have needs, psychological needs from time to time, educational needs, medical needs, Missionaries who get uh, life-threatening diseases in the field, don't have the care they need, wherever they are, et cetera, getting them back home safely, et cetera. 12 people taking care of uh, missionaries plus spouses plus their children. Over 300 people. That's not bloat. We're gonna add uh, this year a couple of positions. I'm also happy to say the funding for missionaries is the best it's ever been. Every single missionary is funded more than a year out. The missionaries have always gone to congregations and, and asked them to support the missions. We train missionaries to, to develop their fund network. Congregations like to know who their missionary is. They like to have the missionary stop by and talk to them. They like to get the newsletters to see what their missionary is doing in Timbuktu. We have the whole system together to do that, help missionaries perform them. We have the record lowest time uh, needed. I think we require half or 70% 70, 70 of funding before they deploy. But we have the lowest time uh, on record from the time missionaries start building their network to the time they get into the field. It's like four months. It's incredible. Um, the system works and it works when there is a there's a decrease in uh, the economy. You people in your congregation say, that's our missionary, we're gonna keep our missionary in good, good shape. It works. It absolutely works. And it's never worked better than it works. So uh, thank you. All, uh, I think fully one third of the Missouri Synod's congregations, 2,000 congregations, so directly support a Missouri Synod missionary. That is phenomenal, and we're thankful for it. The Lothbonian Project is kind of an SMP project for Europe. It's really significant. We've got guys from studying from Pakistan. There are four guys, I just I heard of a month or two ago, four guys, they were not allowed to come for the seminars to Wittenberg. They, uh, in secret, they get into a car, drive to a high hill, and listen, uh, through their phones to classes, uh, not letting their relatives know they're up there unless they should be killed because by their Muslim relatives. We've 
We've got people in planting churches in Romania, in Italy, other places who are enrolled in the program. They come together every so often in Wittenberg for face-to-face -face studies and do online studies. It's not ideal, but it's planting churches. And uh, uh, we have this fantastic congregation in Steglitz in Berlin. It's the largest of the former Muslim congregations, of which there are several in our partner church in Germany. The German church is growing through converting Muslims. God is doing it. In Steglitz, there, there's a congregation, Holy Trinity, which has 1,500 former Muslims. Those Muslims, those uh, uh, Farsi speakers, came to Pastor Martin's a couple of years. I was there. I preached about eight years ago. I preached in St. Mary's Church, where they were filling up the church, and the Germans were getting ticked off because they didn't have any place to sit. And so uh, they they decided to separate, took their pastor. Now they've outgrown their mother church. I was there eight years ago preaching in, in Berlin when the first male convert was baptized. And uh, these are fantastic people. They, they never appreciated Sharia law. They were forced uh, in, in the 6th, 7th century to become Muslims. They knew, and to this day they know they were forced. And they, they uh, at the Council of Nicaea 300, 325, they know that they sent a bishop, a Christian bishop, to represent them at Nicaea. And they want to be done with Islam. And so they asked that in the baptismal rite, they not only renounce the devil and all his words and ways, they asked to renounce uh, Muhammad and the Quran, which they do. And believe me, they receive death threats, etc. So this new program, Livonia Project, we're going to be able to get guys from that congregation on track for Fantastic. And it even, even gets better. Uh, Godfrey Martins has, has told us there are five million Farsi speakers in Europe. The gospel is following the Farsi lines back to Afghanistan and back to Iran. They tell us that the conversions in Iran are happening so quickly that they expect the regime to fall within five years. I don't know. But that's what they're saying. And uh, so we're developing now in Country Martins uh, video resources in the Farsi language to follow that trail uh, back to Afghanistan and back to Iran. It's a great moment. The Dominican Seminary is going great guns. We just had with our partners in Central South America. We've just produced, with the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, we've just produced this Spanish hymnal. It has 700 plus hymns, five divine services, including two new ones, matins, vespers, two services apiece, I think they're new settings. It's got 250 new songs. It's got all the Luther hymns. It's got the catechism, etc., 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 and it's a mule choker. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> but coming out on an app, phone app, won't that be great? So we're, we're just distributing now uh, 19,000 of them in Central and South America, and the next shipload is coming to the LCMS International Center. They'll be available from us at a modest price. <laughs> So uh, we really hope that get, we know that's going to get around a ton. The Dominican Seminary and our other efforts prior over the last 12 years have produced about 200 confessional Lutheran pastors for Central and South America, and now 160 deacons for Central and South America. And we're just getting warmed up. Uh, it, it's a fantastic effort. We have a church, new church in Bolivia. It was started by the Norwegian Lutheran Mission. Never had an ordained pastor. Year, decades, never, never had an uh, ordained pastor. God bless these Norwegian mission societies that do work, you know, but unfortunately they come out of pietism and they don't believe in pastors a lot of the time. So they have women, lay, lay preachers and other things. Well, all of a sudden one of these Bolivians ended up at our seminary in Santiago and he said, here's the rest of Lutheranism. 
goes back home, shares it. All of a sudden, all those guys who've been, uh, they, they want to be ordained. All of a sudden, they, they read about a Quia subscription to the Book of Concord, and they're introduced to the Book of Concord basically the first time. They said, we want to subscribe Quia. And uh, by the way, we want to become a partner church of the Missouri Synod. Okay, we can work on that. <laughs> uh, Taiwan Seminary, you know, the period after World War II, uh, especially in the 60s, we got balled up with the ELCA, essentially ELCA church bodies in Asia. In Japan, uh, in less so in Korea, but Taiwan. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to break fellowship with the Japanese. You know, we've been in talks with them since President Kishnik's era. The old land power, the CPCR has gone over there several times. We sent others over to talk about women's ordination. They've had deaconesses serving as pastors, doing all things pastors do for 10 years. And they, despite our pleas, they changed their constitution officially to ordain women. Real tragedy, the Missouri Senate invested a ton there. But when you have these joint ELCA Missouri Senate partnered seminaries, there's a problem because the liberal theology takes over and this liberal theology does not believe in Acts 4.12. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. No salvation outside of Christ. And as soon as you believe Christianity is not the sole saving religion, then Christianity takes on a completely different form. It's about social justice, it's about women's issues, it's about who knows what. And uh, to be sure, Christians should be concerned about real injustice. Christians should be concerned about uh, fair treatment of people. That's part of the law. That's part of uh, being good citizens. That's part of speaking about the teachings of the scripture against uh, racism and those kind of things. But when you lose the heart, you have no reason to plant churches or even so much to produce pastors. So we're getting out of that relationship in Taiwan. It has been uh, problematic. And the partner church has said they're not, that seminary is not producing pastors for us. We're not planning churches. So pray for us. We're working. We've got the old seminary building and uh, we're rocking and rolling in Taiwan. And, you know, if the Chinese start lobbing bombs, we'll get up and move quickly to someplace else. But this will be the, this will be, I think, the only confessional Lutheran Mandarin speaking seminary in the world. So hang on to your hats. We support about 15 African seminaries variously, uh, with everything from staff and financial support to all kinds of different things, helping them build buildings and dormitories from time to time, and uh, uh, with uh, confessional moving input. We just finished building a, a sem our seminary in Nagarkoil, South India. It's, uh, the, the Indian church is notorious for its squabbles, lawsuits, unending, uh, divisions, all kinds of problems. They're almost like the Missouri Synod. <laughs> but actually, they, they gather around the seminary, which is really a hub for unity. And thanks be to God, I don't know if it's COVID or other things, they've had an Hindu administrator for the church, which has happened in the past because of corruption. Uh, but they're just ready now to proceed with the election of a new president and move forward. We, thankfully, the seminary was totally destroyed by a hurricane a few years ago. And we had disaster money. We've completely rebuilt that seminary. It's never been this nice. It's a great, great moment there for that partner church and uh, for the gospel there. Making Disciples for Life conferences are rocking and rolling. There's going to be one coming up talking about the hard issues of wokeism what that means. Uh, these are just conferences about evangelism, outreach, church planting, and contemporary issues. They've been online. We got hit by COVID, so they were truncated, but they're uh, rocking and rolling. Uh, they're available on the website and the details. We've got about 20,000 Lutheran Early Response Disaster people trained, and that's, a, that's amazing. We now have a web volunteer website where you can go in if you're one of these trainees, or you can get training, you can go in, uh, register for the site you want to go help out, when you want to go, what you want to do. It's volunteer software, keeps you informed about everything. We're also using that for life ministries. 
we're approaching a thousand Life Ministries people who help us with marches all over the country and caring for the needy, uh, crisis pregnancy centers and all those kind of things. Uh, this is really cool. I, I should say on disaster relief, we have the only denominationally produced chainsaw manual in the history of the universe. <laughs> And it has gone. And I guarantee you, it is also the only chainsaw manual to ever go through doctor review and legal. And OSHA. It's available. It's got lots of pictures for you low enders. And uh, so uh, I rec highly recommend it, though. I, I managed to keep Kathy warm all winter long, once living in Northwest Ontario with only a wood stove, but my chainsaw days are over. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we're really thankful for the disaster stuff. Our congregational-based uh, disaster relief has just been a fantastic opportunity for men and women to serve, especially men to serve in these situations. To step up and uh, use your gifts uh, to really make a difference for hurting people. And it always had, we got criticized up and down by the ELCA at first. Eh, ah, you only care about your own people, blah, blah. And uh, then, they, then they were complaining that we were sharing Christ on disaster and we were proselytizing against international rules. Oh, for Pete's sake, give me a break. I just said, look, when we're out cleaning up people's homes and mucking out, we just say, Jesus loves us. We know Jesus loves you. So, uh, anyway, I got a little PTSD. I got to let it go. Let it go, man. <laughs> <laughs> let it go. Let it go. Man. Uh, what we do is, you know, when, when your congregation, your town gets hit by a, a, a hurricane, we call you up. One of our guys calls you up right away, Ross Johnson. Calls the pastor. How you doing? Pastor's house is blown. It's gone away. The church is destroyed. You know, he's got a baby hold, his wife's hanging onto his leg with a baby in her arms, and that's says, yeah, we're fine, we're fine. Should, should we come? No, 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 so, yeah, everything's okay. <laughs> then we go, of course. <laughs> and uh, just help him. We got this, they, they produce this fabulous little notebook. It's, uh, it's, it's all plastic covered pages, so if you're mucking out something, it doesn't get all messed up. But it's everything to do when you get his ass, A, B, C, D, everything you do. It's all there, it's magnificent. It's just, and it's what we've learned over years of doing this stuff. And so what happens, we go, of course, uh, first stop, get the elders together, make sure they're okay, second stop, make sure the congregation members are all okay. Next stop, all of a sudden the congregation members are saying, Okay, we're fine, but our neighbors are in really bad trouble. We need people over here right now with chainsaws or this or that or medical. And then, okay, we need to get Orphan Grain Train down here with a, a shower facility or food. And uh, okay, we'll get we'll have to get the money to get that down there and everything else. And you can participate in the ecumenical effort by providing this X Y Z or whatever else. So that's the way it works, and it's magnificent, magnificent. Do you know, by the way? The, the mayor of New Orleans said a few years ago, if the Lutherans hadn't been there, Camp Restore, Southern District, and the whole rest of the Missouri Synod, if the Lutherans hadn't been there, New Orleans, East New Orleans would not be back yet today. Your church body rebuilt 6,000 homes in New Orleans. Yeah. We thought last fall, Roe is going to fall. Roe is going to fall. And of course, that means that uh, abortion will continue with intensity in those states that continue to offer abortions. That's why places like Illinois have been eliminating all, all uh, impediments to abortion in any way, shape, or form, even creating uh, protections for abortionists who maybe deliver a child who's still alive. So, uh, uh, and they will become a portion of factories. The stupid Republican uh, governor, he's probably in jail in Illinois, but Illinois used to be a pro-life state. They had a law in the books so that when Roe falls, they would 
return to being a pro-life state, but the Republican governor helped get rid of that. Fantastic. Um, anyway, our work will continue apace, and uh, 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 it's going to be challenging coming up. You know, it's going to be a lot of attacks on uh, pro-life efforts, endeavors, and uh, centers uh, in Monroe Falls this month. But God, God's will be done. Uh, we thought, you know, the, the canard is, you don't care about children outside the womb. You just care about children when they're in the womb. You know, you don't take care of them when they're outside. That is just total rubbish. Everything we do in charity and mercy for the Missouri Synod takes care of the life of people at every age. So we put up this uh, life match, million dollars, to match all of your efforts, any of your efforts in your congregation to start a pro-life ministry, care for women in crisis pregnancies, provide resources, housing, etc., uh, to participate with other, other Christians in their pro-life activities. Those grant dollars are available now and go for it. I hope you use them all so we can put up another million. Uh, that's because of the generous donors, that's you. Everyone is witness. We got 19,000 of these sold a month ago. The books are out there. There's packets, these manuals. This is a great Lutheran evangelism program. It's not about going door to door. It's about a very uh, ordered, simple but ordered program for you to consider who in your family needs Jesus. How many of us have family members who are not in church and don't know Christ? All of us, basically. How many of us have workmates that need Jesus? How many of us have friends that need Jesus? And it's, you know, we don't know what to say or when often. This is a wonderful training mod uh, effort that will give you the strength to do that, the, the willingness to do that, and also the plan to do it. I'm going to put these people on my prayer list. This is how I'm going to share Jesus with them. And the goal is basically to share Jesus and to say, by the way, uh, we've got church this Sunday, and I'd like to invite you to come. How'd you like to do that? It's, it's really a fantastic effort, and it's at CPH out there. And there are uh, modules, video modules coming for, you know, how to approach people who find science a stumbling block or woke issues a stumbling block or any other kind of thing. Uh, the ELCA, unfortunately, had to cancel its youth gathering because of COVID. We were near to doing the same. A year, year and a half ago, we decided, oh, Lord have mercy upon us, we're gonna go forward. I'm happy to say, we'll be in Houston, down in the great state of Texas, and uh, Mike Newman will host us there with that uh, great event. And we have, we have exceeded the reservations. The cap has been met. 19,000 kids are gonna be there. So. <laughs> we want your kids. We need church workers. We know that the youth gathering has a significant effect. 10% of church workers said the youth gathering was the biggest thing in me deciding to become a church worker. Get your kids, and, and we've helped those, those uh, gatherings. We've strengthened the, uh, the worship of the gatherings and work hard to have quality stuff there. So make an effort to get your kids there. Uh, Higher Things does a great job. They, they uh, got, what, several thousand kids a year, fantastic. The same phenomenon, phenomena happen at those gatherings for young people. And they, these kids just look around and say, hey, you know, I'm not weird, I'm just Missouri Synod. Child Protection Pro, a rural and small town ministry of more resources on the web about how to look at getting together with other congregations uh, and uh, a lot of resources that are going on there on the lcms.org site. Child Protection Program is almost, it's coming through legal. Legal this, legal that, legal this, legal that, that's it. You know, you ever read uh, Luther's Sermon Against Lawyers? <laughs> it came out one of the recent new Luther volumes. It's titled, The Lawyer's Sweat Bath. <laughs> that's another story. The Child Protection Program, we like our lawyers. They're Missouri Senate, they keep us out of a lot of trouble. It's just coming through legal, but, I'll tell you, um, a few
few years, a couple years ago, the statute of limitations in Minnesota was lifted on, on child abuse cases, sexual abuse cases, and uh, as has happened in many places. And the Missouri Senate is not without its fault, without its past mistakes. 30 years ago, the Council of Presidents put in place a one strike and you're out on sexual abuse, sexual misconduct. Best thing we ever did. Uh, we're not perfect. There have been people who've been hurt in the Missouri Senate associated related entities, etc. Uh, this is a tool to help that not happen. And it would be for your congregation, your RSOs and ministries. So we're very happy about this coming out. But that statute of limitations was lifted in Minnesota. Three Roman Catholic dioceses had essentially 600 lawsuits filed the next day. You know how many Missouri Senate uh, cases we had as a result of that? Two. So, uh, the Baptists, I, I noticed, were in the news lately about, and you're down here in the Bible Belt, you probably heard about it, about a list of uh, abusive pastors. You know, I just, I'm, we've got our failings, but I'm just saying, well, I, I am not aware of any, I'm not aware of any case that has not or is not being dealt with. So, uh, and they, they keep coming up here and there. Sometimes it's a he said, she said kind of a thing. And you gotta, you gotta be careful about protecting rights and those kind of things. But I'm proud of the Missouri Senate in this regard. God help us. We are not only in the best financial shape in the last 30 years, we are in the best financial shape in the history of the Missouri Senate. It is uh, shocking, frankly. It happened because of generous giving, tight purse strings. It happened because of amazing gifts, planned giving, and uh, it's a phenomenal moment. A phenomenal moment. And my goal is that we use these funds to leverage the future so that we can keep the Missouri Senate strong long in the future. Doing things like uh, you know, paying, have, paying for all with internal revenue, internal investment funds, paying for all costs for mission administration. So if people give, they're giving 100% toward missionaries or something like that. Although I must say, our, our fund costs are currently 8.5 cents on the dollar. You know, better, the Better Business Bureau gives you like 40 cents, 35 cents. It costs us 8.5 cents on a dollar. That's phenomenal. It's the gold standard, folks. Um, we have, uh, we have, uh, we've given about $4 million to the seminary the, the last year. The seminaries are, are going strong. They continually need our support. Set apart to serve church work recruitment. That's rock and roll. It's uh, <coughs> producing resources for you to get in the hands of young people young children and uh, everybody. It's also uh, starting up a section that will work on second career, getting second career people to uh, consider church work. We are, we are in deep need of teachers. We are nowhere near even close. The number of uh, church work students, teacher grads has dropped in half probably in 15 years. We need, we need many, many more teachers. We're at about 475 vacancies right now. That is calling congregations that want a pastor, 475. The good news is you need about 400 to keep things moving. You get less than that, then you, you know, congregations that get grumpy with their pastor don't have a chance to uh, make a change, or pastors make a change. So, uh, but the, the future is going to be very challenging. The future is going to be very challenging. We need these, uh, we need these uh, various alternate routes, etc. But we need guys to get to the seminary. I should say, what did I want to say? What did I want to say? I'll, I'll remember. Uh, set apart to serve. Oh, you know, if you've got situations, we we eliminated the licensed lay deacon as pastor. 2016, 74% of the vote. We we 
ordained 200 of those guys, most of them that were in Word and Sacrament ministry. Got them ordained as alternate route SMP. That's closed. But one thing the Wichita Res Resolution of 89 did and did not get overturned by the convention in 2016 was there's such a thing as a lay reader. If you got a rural congregation that can't get a pastor every Sunday, it's okay to have a man lead the liturgy and read a sermon. Not doing the sacraments. Unless baptism is an emergency. Or something. That is long Lutheran tradition for that practice. So, no congregation. The, the resolution 2016 said no congregation should close for uh, not being able to get its license lay deacon ordained. So we review those situations every year and make exceptions. Just a few thoughts for you. Uh, relationships count, the 2017 youth ministry study. It is very, very good, still very good. And I tell you that as a deep expert on youth, I spent about a million dollars in 20 years studying two of them in my basement. <laughs> I know about this. You probably do too. Relationships count. Uh, how much hair the pastor has doesn't count. How cool the pastor is doesn't count. What really counts is longevity of the pastorate. That is the, one of the most significant pieces of retaining youth in the, in the church. Very significant. Relationships count. Offering young people the opportunity to serve counts. I love it when I go to a congregation and the ushers have a a five-year-old who's got a suit on and his little usher tag, and he's holding the hands of, uh, of the of the usher when he's walking forward to hand in the plates. Inviting young people to be part of simple service of the church, loving people, finding a place where they can talk about the challenges they face in life. It's not about having guitars. It's not about rock and roll. It's not about and we interviewed 400 kids who had left the Missouri Center. Not about any of those things. Read the reports available online through youth ministries. It will surprise you. Large catechism annotated like the Lutheran Study Bible coming out. Uh, just the latest magnificent project from CPH. I'm very excited about this. Two million dollar church planting grant. We've learned a number of things about church planting. In fact, Michael Newman helped us in, in uh, one of the seminars we had on that issue. Uh, lent his uh, considerable knowledge to the task. We've learned a number of things. Church plants with a lot of synod and district money generally do not succeed. Uh, church planters tend to be good at uh, uh, stirring up people to get together and start off, but they tend to lack organizational long-term skills. Church planters tend to stay too long, too short a time at a congregation. Uh, what else did we learn? There were there were quite a number of other things. The most successful church plants tend to be mother-daughter congregations, or maybe a circuit daughter church. We discovered that most pastors in the synod are pro-church plant. It's just that, like one guy said, I'm all for it. It's just that I can get up in front of my congregation and exhaust my knowledge in five minutes. There are half the counties in America that don't have Elsimus churches. Yes, I know. There are challenges we have rurally and, and challenges in the inner city. There are uh, ethnic scenarios that uh, are challenging but are increasingly being met uh, with opportunities. I was just told by Al Buckman in St. Louis about two weeks ago. He's, he's an old missionary for the Synod and uh, chairman of the board for Friends of New Americans, and they, they are feeding about 200 uh, immigrants into the LCMS congregations of St. Louis a year. Many baptisms. Al told me, I don't think we're going to have to close another city church in St. Louis. Isn't that wonderful? So uh, the idea is boot camp, a church planter's boot camp to uh, bring church planters together share the best to a partner and accompany people while they're planting and uh, uh, 
a number of other things. So we're very excited about this. This is a new donor and there's a lot of money available from this donor. We're, we're looking at small grants. Plants that tend to uh, succeed have local investment. Small matching grants to get it rolling. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's the 175th anniversary of Synod. Tons of great stuff. You can go online and find uh, any number of resources and we are blessed. So at this point then, do we have Q&A? Yeah, yes. Please, don't be bashful. Step to the microphone. Do we have one? Oh, I thought that was a microphone. That's the camera. <laughs> I was just curious of uh, what's happening since we lost our physical plan in Hong Kong with the mission and ministry there. We never did lose our physical plan. We had we had an apartment, and uh, I think we had we had two apartments, and we had four or five yeah. other apartments. Yeah, we had two mic guys. I, I, you I do have a lapel mic and it's on. Except it was on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So we had these apartments there. Um, what happened was uh, prior to my tenure in uh, the, the previous administration, sold sold an apartment that had increased in value to something like ten million dollars. It was a good move to sell. Uh, they took part of that and bought another apartment for like a million and a half. And uh, during my tenure, that apartment increased in value from a million and a half to over like uh, something like 20 million. So uh, what we did was we had been, we found we found out the properties we had. Uh, we talked with our Hong Kong partner group and said, hey, uh, we want to give you these properties. I don't know how much that was worth at the time. Millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars. We want to sign these over to you because these are all the church properties, some other properties that were destined for a church. This apartment for a missionary was never destined for a partner church. And the ones that the ones that we sold. We gave the other oh, we went to them and said, hey. We looked at the documents from the board of directors 10 years ago. You guys were supposed to do the paperwork locally to take these properties, and you haven't done that. Please do it. Tens of millions of dollars. And then uh, we sold that property, which has pre two properties, I think. It's been a long time now. Two properties have appreciated dramatically. We would have been fools not to sell them. <coughs> And so at that time, then the president of our Hong Kong partner church began a disinformation campaign on the reality of what happened. Unfortunately, that was picked up by a political organization within the Senate, and uh, the truth uh, got lost in the haze. I would just like to know your view of BPM. Yes. Practices Ministry Conference in uh, Arizona. You know, I've not been invited. I, bet I, I don't recall being invited. Hey, it's a place where a lot of people go together and they try to find. Me. And uh, Jeff Train has been very generous in letting loads and loads of people, uh, loads and loads of people, talk about ideas they have and what's happening. So uh, that's all. Exhausted all of your things. <laughs> I want to say um, thank you to Barry. You know, um, he's a consummate pastor uh, with a heart that is an um, amazing heart for the gospel and care for people. And uh, he has demonstrated that on the Council of Presidents for a little over these many years. I, the majority of the years I have had the pleasure of serving with him. And 
and uh, he adds a that dimension. And there's another dimension he adds, which you know full well. He has a, a, just a shockingly quick way. <laughs> and he has kept us in stitches for more than a decade. And that is more, humor is the shock absorber of life. It's a divine gift. And uh, it's a pro Luther. Luther's set of jokes that will offend most of you. It's one of my favorites. The world is a giant ass, and I'm a right stool, and I fear we are about to part company. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't suggest that for a sermon title. <laughs> but uh, humor is such a divine gift, and the Council of Presidents goes through so much. So be a district president, it is drama. Well, it's a it's a pleasure and joy when you're dealing with, you know, five plus percent of congregations at any given time in some kind of crisis. Church workers in crisis. Disagreements, differences, um, personality challenges, <coughs> workers who have committed uh, acts that require them to be removed, people you've known for decades, cared about, loved. It is not an easy business. And uh, no one, you know, no one really knows. Kind of pain that these guys bear, you know, and they're very graceful most of the time. And uh, so, Barry being there with as a constant pastor, and there with good humor, uh, has been more valuable to me than I can I can express. Uh, and so, thank you, Barry. Barry. Everybody, part of God's peace, and have a break for a few minutes. 